We'll now begin our next session, a look at the many new and ongoing initiatives and services that are underway at your Federation of State Medical Boards on your behalf. Dr. Hank Chaudhry, President and CEO of the FSMB, will now provide us with an update on the Federation's activities. Hank. Thank you, Dr. Simons. What a great morning. We've had lots of great discussions, a lot of engagement from all of you in talking about what's happening at the state boards. We've heard from some of our partner organizations, ABMS, WMC, NCCPA. Uh, what I'd like to now do over the next uh, few minutes or so is to go over what the FSMB has been doing in this space on your behalf. So if you'll indulge me, uh, let's start. Okay, first of all, I'd like to welcome not only the state boards and the leaders of various organizations, but we have about 50 uh, CEOs and chairs of national organizations. So as I start to, started to put this slide together, I said, you know what, let me recognize some of our national leaders. Well, I got it down to eight font because there are so many of you. So uh, I don't know if you can all read this, and I was going to read everyone's name, but then I think my, my time will be up by the time I was done. So uh, if you'll forgive me, I wanted to acknowledge everyone on this page. Thank you for being here. We value your collaboration with the FSMB. We appreciate you all being here. It really means a lot to us, not just from the US, but also, as you can see, from Canada, Ghana, the Gambia, South Africa, and I'm sure I'm missing a couple of countries and a couple of states, but thank you. I hope I'm, uh, forgive me if I've not included everyone. At the same time, I'd like to thank the leadership of the FSMB Foundation. How many of you know about the FSMB Foundation? Raise your hands. Okay, many of you, but not all of you, and that's not surprising because out of more than 400 of you, we learned that 216 of you are attending this meeting for the very first time. And a lot of you are brand new to medical regulation because there has been some turnover uh, since the pandemic. So please go to the FSME Foundation booth, ask questions. The foundation over the last five years has given a quarter of a million dollars for grants to allow the state boards to study things like um, COVID-19, how to cope, how to manage. They've studied audio-based telemedicine, for example, working with not just state boards, but other agencies as well. And our president of the FSMB Foundation, Jan Ryan, Dr. Ryan is here as well. Please go to the booth, learn more about what they do. They could support some of the wonderful experiments and pilot projects that you all talked about. So what I'd like to do is to talk about a little bit about how the pandemic impacted the FSMB and then talk about four of our principal areas where we work to support state boards, advocacy, assessment services, information services, and operations. Hard to believe back in December 31st, 2019, which seems like, I don't know, a decade ago, but it was only uh, less than three years ago, uh, officially, according to Johns Hopkins University, there were only 27 cases. I think there were more than 27 probably by then, but uh, that's the official number. And look at where we are today in just a little over two years, a half a billion people uh, infected by this tiny little virus that's less than half a, a size of a human hair uh, has really done considerable damage. Global deaths officially are 6 million, uh, and some of you have seen reports from the World Health Organization that it's probably higher. Could be as high as 15 million. There's some politics about releasing that figure, but uh, again, these are deaths that we know about. Many countries, including the U.S., have had higher deaths rates than normal uh, that are not directly attributable to COVID, but are probably indirectly attributable because you had people with chest pain who didn't call 911. You had people with strokes who didn't call 911. You had people who should have gotten cancer screening that could have saved their lives that didn't go that route because they were afraid of catching the virus. So all that is contributing to at least a million deaths in the US, uh, 81 million confirmed cases. Uh, two of my sons are among those 81 million cases. So one of the things that the Federation did early on was to create an emergency preparedness and response work group uh, our chair at the time, Dr. Cheryl Walker McGill, who I know is in the back, she was the chair of this, and we had lots of discussions. We had membership from our state boards, from New York, from Massachusetts. You know, two of those places were among the epicenter of the global uh, pandemic back in early 2020, back in March and April. So we had the benefit of hearing firsthand what was happening on the ground. But this work group has put together some recommendations which um, hopefully you all have a chance to look at. Um, many of you have already pro provided some feedback and we've made some changes, but it'll be one of the documents that we'll be presenting to our House of Delegates uh, this weekend. 
this is just a summary of what they did was to provide some guidance to state boards, uh, the work group offered some model language about state emergency orders that can provide uniformity and licensure portability. Uh, we hope this is the last pandemic, but if there's another one or if this one becomes worse, we want to make sure you all have the guidance and maybe the statutory language you need to make sure you're ready for the next emergency. And that also means giving you the links to resources and tools, which we know have been helpful because our state boards have told us that. Now, th this is going back a couple of bit uh, when as Dr. Scott Steingard walks in, Dr. Steingard, FSMB chair, was chair of the FSMB when the pandemic started on March the 11th of 2020. And within weeks, within days, the nation, states, and territories responded. I'm not going to read everything on this slide. You all know this already, but for some of you who are new to your board, you may not know this, and some of our national partners may not know this. Everything from uh, allowing telemedicine, allowing licensure to be practiced across state lines, physicians to practice across state lines. Uh, at least 11 states that we're aware of allowed uh, early MD and DO graduates to provide care under the supervision of a licensed physician before they start their uh, internship training. I mentioned during the earlier session the Coalition for Physician Accountability. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is the nation's house of medicine, the chairs and CEOs of all of the regulatory organizations involved in education, assessment, certification, regulation, licensure, um, and we had lots of conversations and discussions. We mentioned earlier about how one of the decisions we made uh, early on in the pandemic was for medical school students applying for residency or international graduates applying for residency, a decision was made that it was not going to be safe to have people traveling all over the country doing residency interviews. So a decision was made to make all of those interviews virtual. That decision originated at the Coalition for Physician Accountability. So it's good that we have this sort of grouping of people who come together once or twice a year or as often as they need to. And they had lots of discussions about many different things and the FSMB played an active role in those conversations. One of the things we did was early on, April 9th, so less than a month after the pandemic, we, working with our colleagues, and all of the letters are up there, uh, I don't have time to read through each of those acronyms and abbreviations, but I'm happy to tell you them later. Um, we supported strengthened efforts not only to safeguard the public, that's obvious because the primary mission of state boards is to protect the public, but we also wanted to make sure that our nation's healthcare workforce doctors, PAs, nurses, pharmacists, um, dentists, everyone was also uh, protected uh, during the COVID pandemic so that they can remain able to meet the public's needs. All of that was very, very important as there was a shortage, remember, of personal protective equipment, for example. And so we, we felt it was important to be on the record and say that while we're historically there to protect the public and do licensure and discipline, we're also there to make sure that our workforce is able to do the job that they're already doing or trying to do. We also worked with our colleagues uh, across the other professions, our colleagues in nursing, and I know we have our leadership here from the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, uh, NABP, we have the leadership of the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, uh, our colleagues in psychology, physical therapy, occupational therapy, social work, and we issued a consensus statement that we remain committed as organizations to public health, public protection, and patient safety, and will continue to explore ways to support qualified healthcare professionals as they respond in this evolving national emergency. Notice the date. Nine days after the pandemic was declared, we issued this statement because we wanted to make sure that we were all working together or at least having some conversations because in an emergency like that, you do want to come together like that. So one of the things, among, especially in states that had early graduates of MD and DO schools, what do you call a physician who's gotten their degree but hasn't actually started their training yet? They're not an intern, they're not a resident, they are a doctor, but they're not a doctor technically because they're not licensed yet. So in places like New York, a new category of physician had to be created. The COVID-19 junior physician. Um, and just one example of basically the regulatory system trying to figure this out in real time. Another innovation, if you won't go to the hospital for your chest pain or your possible stroke, 
or because you need dialysis or because you need uh, some sort of care, you're afraid to get care, well, the hospital will go to you. I don't believe, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, if this sort of thing happened before the pandemic. But again, uh, you know, in an emergency, these sorts of things happen all across the country in various interesting experiments because, again, care had to be delivered. Of course, we all started working from home, and it had its pros and cons. Uh, I know initially my wife and kids loved having me around, and then there was a time where, let's just say, the love was a little bit less because uh, I was constantly, for one thing, I was using the living room sofa from my web uh, webinars, and my wife noticed that our very nice sofa had a depression from where I was sitting, and she said, you're going to have to move. That's not acceptable. And so I moved to the basement. Uh, so again, you make the necessary adjustments, and I was fortunate. I was able to work from home, but obviously our licensees did not have that luxury. Neither did service workers and many others. In fact, even at the FSMB, we have about 170 employees full-time. Um, you heard uh, this morning that 10 of them, about 10 of them are in our DC office. The remainder are in Texas by and large, but we also had about 12 or 13 employees who still had to come in every single day throughout the pandemic because somebody had to open up the doors, somebody had to check the mail, uh, you know, and we obviously had a lot of that going on. So you've heard today, and let me give you some numbers. Uh, prior to the pandemic, the overall utilization of telemedicine as a whole was less than 1%. Uh, this is from Dr. Michael Barnett, uh, uh, this slide from a study from Dr. Patel in 2021 in JAMA Internal Medicine. At one point, there were on, almost as many telemedicine visits in the United States as there were in-person visits. In fact, I've seen variations of this slide where there were actually more telemedicine visits in some parts of the country than in-person visits. No one expected that to occur. The system responded, and you heard Dr. Levine say that was made possible because of changes in reimbursement. And also, HIPAA regulations, no one mentioned, were relaxed. So one of the reasons my mom was able to use telemedicine, as I mentioned earlier, was because she needs help with downloading sometimes certain apps and I was like, how did you do telemedicine? What app did you download? She's like, oh no, my doctor said to use FaceTime. FaceTime was allowed because again, HIPAA regulations were relaxed. The, the country needed to deliver care and anything was possible. Uh, of course, now that we're in a different phase, we're gonna have to look at that and the FSMB's telemedicine work group has some recommendations. Now, which specialists use telemedicine the most? Endocrinology was actually the highest, uh, up to 70% up to of endocrinologists in diabetes care, chronic care, certain conditions where that was important. Uh, number two and number three were gastroenterology and neurology. And then on the bottom, hardly used at all, was optometry, chiropractic, physical therapy, uh, ophthalmology, orthopedics. Um, so th we thought that was interesting. So the FSMB, again, recognizing that not every state board may be aligned in how to address this once this pandemic is over, put together a work group on telemedicine. Uh, that's our role, is to bring the experts together, include you, and then figure out something that could be of use to you. And so Sean Parker, one of our uh, board members, uh, public member on the North Carolina uh, Medical Board was the chair, and we hope you've had a chance to look at the report of the telemedicine work group, because that'll be discussed and voted on at the House of Delegates this weekend. We also learned, um, we talked about this a little bit in the panel discussion, that um, healthcare disparities that were always there surfaced uh, during this pandemic. We learned, I don't know how well you can see this, but in terms of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, if you look at the numbers, much higher in African American populations, Native American populations, and Hispanic or Latino populations as well. So, and then along with the murder of George Floyd, this became an issue where uh, everyone was looking at health equity, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So the FSMB put together a work group looking at DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in medical regulation, chaired by Jeff Carter. Dr. Carter is a member of our board, anesthesiologist, and uh, this work group uh, has a interim report to prepare. It's still in operation and will continue in the coming year and provide more guidance as we learn more about these sorts of issues. Probably the biggest breakthrough, uh, and some of you know I have a public health background. I was health commissioner on Long Island during the last 
pandemic we had, which was, the last pandemic was not 1918. The last pandemic was 2009, uh, the H1N1 influenza. Thankfully, it wasn't as bad, but probably the biggest breakthrough of why we didn't have as many deaths as we did in 1918 was because of science, was because of the innovations of our vaccines. Um, truly have saved millions of lives because otherwise it would have been as bad as 1918. Do you all remember how many people died in the 1918 uh, Spanish influenza, they call it? At least 50 million people, anywhere from 50 to 100 million people. Remember I mentioned how many people got infected that we know of from COVID? What was the number? Just trying to see if you're paying attention. 510 million, yes, Brent Carlton from Texas, good man. Uh, he must have an Air Force background. Yes, pays attention, good man. Um, half a billion, how many people that we know of got infected by the H1N1 influenza in 1918 that we know of? Roughly the same number, half a billion. So 1918, half a billion infected, 50 million deaths. Fast forward 2020 to 22, 500 million infected, only 6 to 15 million. So it could have been a lot worse. Of course, science, many people acknowledged, others didn't. And so we had an issue with fake COVID news, that it contains a microchip, that it uh, causes more deaths than the actual virus. Um, this is from a UNESCO webinar I participated in that said that uh, about 59% of the misinformation uh, that they sampled in a study they did was misrepresentation of existing facts, so that's where interpretations get twisted. But 38% was completely fabricated, completely brand new stuff that n has no basis in reality. Now, 20% of the misinformation, according to this one study, came from politicians, celebrities, who can be very influential, uh, and other social media influencers. Um, I actually had an opportunity, I was on a plane sitting next to someone and I said, you know, we started talking and I explained what I did and I said, what do you do for a living? And he said, oh, my full-time job is I'm a social media influencer. Wow. Um, I didn't ask what, how much they made, but uh, chances are they probably made millions because they do well. But uh, these sorts of misinformation sources accounted for 69% of the social media engagement um, and so this was something to reckon with. This is an interesting study. I don't know if you intuitive, intuitively would have known this. 54% of all humans use the internet. And, this, and the study ends at 2019, so it's probably closer to 60%. That's a lot of people who have access to the internet and social media. It's not the entire world, but it's heading in that direction. So what that means is, in theory, a tweet that you issue or a post on LinkedIn right now could go all around the world within seconds and could go viral and could potentially be seen by 60% of humanity. There's a power there because you can get good information across, but you can also get misinformation. And as you heard, sometimes misinformation is more sexy and interesting than uh, accurate information, which sometimes is seen as boring uh, and sometimes is, has so much jargon that the average person can't make heads or tails of it. One of the discussions I've had with medical schools during the last couple of years is, I think we need to do a better job with our training of the next generation of physicians, not only about bedside manner, that's important, not only about how to take a medical history, that's important, but also the art of persuasion and understanding when there's resistance, how do you overcome that through words? I think that's gonna be important. And then how do you use technology? Uh, many of them are digital natives, the next generation, but maybe they don't necessarily know where are the, the um, sort of danger zones in those areas. So we put together an FSMB Ethics and Professionalism Committee, um, got lots of attention. Um, you heard Dr. Levine mention this group as well. Katie Templeton from Oklahoma is the chair of this uh, group um, and has put together many of the recommendations that were adopted by the FSMB's board of directors over the last uh, year, certainly. We also stayed in touch with all of you. Um, you know, none of you were meeting in person. We love doing boardside visits and seeing what's going on on the ground, but there was no ground. In fact, I remember some of our board members saying, um, Hank, how come we're not visiting state boards? I'm like, 
because they're not having traditional meetings. They're meeting virtually. So we did the next best thing. We had phone conversations, tons of them. And then we had conversations like this on webinars with the leadership, in this case, with the Medical Board of California. Uh, Christina Lawson, who's one of our award members, is the uh, president of the board. Um, and uh, Bill Prasivka is the uh, executive director and the other leaders of that board. We also had similar conversations. I'm just giving two examples of many. Uh, this is a staying in touch with the leadership of the New York State Board of Medicine as well. So we have conversations like this all the time. Some of you were kind enough to invite us to either participate or provide some comments at your own board meeting, in, which were virtual, and we were happy to do that. So yesterday morning, uh, I happened to look out my window, got up early, and I saw what a beautiful sunrise. This is New Orleans from my hotel room on the 17th floor. And then I did what everyone probably does when they get up in the morning and view the sunshine. I charged up my, got my phone out, and the headline was this. This is 5.32 in the morning. <laughs> United States is out of the pandemic phase. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is interesting timing since we're about to have a national meeting here and there is some concern and anxiety. I hope he's right because there is some concern about some increasing cases. There's concern about what's happening in the UK. But just the fact that we're beginning to think in this way tells me that we're beginning to possibly, I have to hedge my bets here, possibly thinking about the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and so that's important because then we have to start thinking about the questions that you all are getting from licensees. What's going to happen? What are you going to allow after the pandemic is officially over and the public health emergency is no longer in operation? Can they still practice across state lines the way they're doing now? No. Um, what will you allow? And that's where I think you'll have to make some important decisions, and some of you have made those decisions already. So if the pandemic is truly over, what does that mean? Well, this is from the World Health Organization. It could mean scenario one, where we have the fifth endemic coronaviruses. For those of you who are knowledgeable of epidemiology, public health, uh, endemic means it's around. Um, Lyme disease is endemic. Um, West Nile virus is endemic. It's everywhere. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's a pandemic and causing mass destruction. So there are already four coronaviruses that exist uh, commonly and cause various degrees of illness. This could be the fifth endemic coronavirus, which causes mild illness in the majority of cases. Or it could be scenario two, where it becomes flu-like. Now, flu-like sounds like, oh, that's not too bad. But remember, people die of the flu. So it could be recurring epidemics, maybe once a year. Maybe we'll need once a year vaccination is where this is headed. Let me shift gears and now talk about FSMB and specific operations, beginning with advocacy. Um, I, we felt that just me talking wouldn't work uh, as effectively as showing you some videos. So I have my colleagues, uh, the senior staff of the FSMB, who are going to give you little snippets of information about what they do. So let's begin with uh, chief, our chief advocacy officer. You all know her well, Lisa Robin. Having a professional community and dedicated team to address the advocacy and policy needs of our state medical boards is extremely important today. Whether by focusing on individual boards at home with their state legislators or messaging at the federal level, as we adjust to the post-pandemic environment, advocacy becomes extremely important as changes are inevitable. We're proud of the policy work we did this year, issuing recommendations and guidance documents addressing the most pressing needs of our state medical boards. Great. We thought it was important for you to you know, put a face to the name, especially for those of you who are new. They're all here in this audience, so please reach out, touch base, touch, uh, talk about what are the issues that are relevant to you, and we're happy to help in any way that we can. So in advocacy, speaking of advocacy, uh, you should all be getting, as a member of a state medical board or an osteopathic board, our periodic advocacy network newsletter. Um, and if you don't, please tell us uh, and give us your email address. We'll be happy to include you in that. Because sometimes, you all know this, sometimes the state board is the last person to find out that there's a new law in your state. Sometimes the legislators don't always tell you. Or they tell you the midnight before and there's very little time to intervene. Not always, but sometimes. But uh, this will give you a snapshot of what's happening across the country. We also do our e-news newsletter twice a week. How many of you get, you get that? Raise your hands. 
Okay, most of you do. If you don't, again, give us your uh, email address at the registration desk, and we'd be happy to include you on that. It's a brief, it's not a long newsletter. It's just giving you some sort of highlights of what's been going on in the last few days. We also have an FSMB policy clearinghouse. Uh, thank, I'd like to thank Dr. Walker McGill for championing that when she was chair. You can now access what your colleagues across uh, your state lines are doing in areas like medical marijuana. We had a good discussion about that this morning. Expert witnesses, criminal background checks, how best to do criminal background checks, opioids, pain management, CME requirements, et cetera. We would love it if some of these could be more harmonized. So if you're not sure you're, and you're changing some of your rules related to these subjects, please look at what your colleagues are doing and please look at what FSMB recommends because FSMB's recommendations also come from input from you all. Uh, and the link is there on the bottom um, for you in case you wanted to reach that. But just go to the FSMB's website and you can get to the clearinghouse. So some of the examples of uh, advocacy in the last uh, couple of years, last year, we did have a meeting with the U.S. Surgeon General staff. You heard Admiral Levine talk about Dr. Murthy. Dr. Murthy was one of our keynote speakers some years ago. And one of his areas of focus is medical misinformation. So we had a nice chat with him about wellness and burnout. That's another major area of concern for him. I think there are a lot of areas where we are aligned. They're about to issue a major report related to uh, physician wellness and wellness in the general population. And we wanted to make sure that they knew to highlight what the state boards have been doing. So part of our role is not just to serve you, but also to make sure that people know who you are and understand what you've been doing. Just last month, we had a day on the Hill, so several of our uh, state board, uh, FSMB board members met with more than 20 congressional offices to advocate on your behalf, to remind them of the role that you play, and to remind them um, of the importance of various issues, whether it's wellness or certain other pieces of federal legislation that impact all of you. Um, and then also we had some, how many of you, I'm just curious, how many of you happen to have seen, because it was mentioned in E! News, a recent report of the Veterans Administration's Office of Inspector General. Show of hands. Okay, only a handful. Please look at that report. Um, the report talks about something that should not be shocking, although it is surprising. When a VA medical center takes action against a licensee, whether it's a physician or a PA, they don't always share that information with the National Practitioner Data Bank or with the State Medical or Osteopathic Board. For those of you who are veterans, you know this is not new news, but it is disappointing that this is still an issue. So the report has prompted the VA to issue some changes in how their policies are. So we hope that'll do it, but just to make sure, we're gonna have a chat with the OIG office and with the VA to touch base with those who are going to be addressing this problem, because it is a problem. Because when a physician or a PA leaves the VA system and they go into the civilian world, you'd like more than just a blank piece of paper about what's happened during their time. So we're gonna be working on that so that you have the information you need so you can fulfill your mission to protect the public. I'm not gonna read everything, but these are some of the federal legislative priorities that we have. The Triage Act, the Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act, which did pass and was signed into law by President Biden. Um, and again, please attend the FSMB luncheon if you can for Corey Feist's presentation about that and the general subject of physician wellness, the VA Provider Accountability Act, and the Drugs Act, uh, which is supported by the FSMB. Notice a lot of these are bipartisan, which sometimes enables legislation to move forward. Um, that last one is to help curb illegal online drug sales. And we've been working closely over the years with our partners at the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy in those areas as well. Now, state legislative priority, you've heard uh, several mentions of this this morning already. Um, I don't know how well you know this beyond your jurisdiction because you're probably all busy in your own jurisdiction, but as of April 12th of this year, 76 bills have been introduced in 29 states during the 21-22 legislative session. Of these, 66 restrict your authority and 11 of them explicitly allow for off-label treatment of COVID-19, which is interesting because by law, physicians are already allowed to prescribe uh, off-label uses for FDA-approved medications. So why do you need uh, you know, legislation for that? Um, not all of these bills passed, 
Some of them died in committee, or they died in conference, or they died because the legislator ended. Let me give you, an, and the FSMB's board uh, felt it was important because we were hearing concerns from state boards about what's happening uh, to us. Because it really didn't happen early in the pandemic or in the middle of the pandemic. Most of this started back in October, November, or December, most of it. So the FSMB did issue a statement uh, saying that we believe state board authority is important and we would ask legislators to please work with your state boards if you're going to uh, inst introduce legislation that might impact how a state board operates. Notice we didn't say don't issue legislation. They have every right to issue legislation, but could you at least work with the state boards was the plea. So here's some examples of some of the state legislatures in COVID-19. Again, this is Maryland, Kentucky, and Iowa, just happened to pick on three. The legislative periods ended, which means these bills died, but they could be reintroduced next year. Um, I'm not gonna read through each one, but I will read the Iowa one, not to pick on Iowa, but Iowa's legislature had a bill, um, 2265. Um, I thought it was interesting. It said that a pharmacist who does not dispense an FDA-approved drug for off-label use in accordance with a licensee's prescription shall be guilty of an aggravated misdemeanor. Wow, that's pretty strong language. Um, again, and a lot of this includes pharmacy, includes nursing, includes medicine. These are the types of bills that we're seeing. Many of them don't get the light of day because there's some common sense among many of the broader legislatures that that's not how you move forward on these things. Uh, but in other cases, the state boards have had to intervene to explain, and many of the bills, by the time they start off to the time they end, are a lot different than when they started out. I just want to give you a sampling of what's out there. Some of them are equally prohibitive and, and you know, threaten penalties against doctors for doing this or not doing that. Of course, speaking of science, you know, because there's so many publications that uh, a practicing physician or PA can keep up with, this just came out this week, as a matter of fact, in New England Journal of Medicine. It's a large, randomized uh, study looking at ivermectin, I've, something to look at. It's a major study looking at uh, several thousand patients, some who got placebo, some who got ivermectin, and there was found to be no uh, significant benefit in terms of preventing hospitalizations or preventing death. That's an important type of a study in a major journal like the New England Journal of Medicine. But again, there's so much information out there, uh, I bet most people didn't even get a chance to see something like that. So part of our role at the FSMB is to help um, at working with our colleagues to make sure the right information gets to the people who can make the right decisions for their patients. Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, um, you all know the story, or you should know the story. This started back in 2013. Uh, there were a lot of threats about national licensure. There were complaints that the state boards weren't working fast enough to issue licenses. And some even said that maybe the whole process of state medical licensure was outdated and needed to be thrown out the window. Um, so we had a meeting. The FSMB facilitated a meeting. We, there were some federal grants that supported those kinds of meetings. And we said, basically, in a room full of state board members, we said, what are we going to do about this? And one of the ideas that emerged was maybe one way to preserve state authority and yet expedite licensure is to create an interstate compact. Um, and there was an interstate compact in nursing at the time, but the medicine compact became different because the medicine board said, if we're gonna do this, we wanna know if someone's practicing in our jurisdiction, number one, and number two, we want to issue the licenses. We don't want a compact to be issuing a license. The state board will issue a license. So fast forward, the um, state boards got together, decided on nine criteria. Uh, that's amazing in and of itself, that if a physician, uh, MD or DO, uh, or international graduates meets those nine criteria, that the state boards would be ready, willing, and able to issue a license to practice medicine instantly. Let me repeat. Instantly, that's a big change from what it was before. And as of this month, we now have 35 states plus the District of Columbia plus Guam that have signed the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact into law. Um, according to FSMB data, 80% of the nation's physicians could be eligible for multiple licenses through this expedited pathway if they wanted to get more than one license. Now, what about the other 20%? 
they're welcome to get as many licenses as they want, but they'd have to do it one state at a time um, or go through the regular processes. So this, in many ways, is like a TSA pre-check. If you meet the nine criteria, you can get it. And it will be, there's an exhibit for the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. Many of you are more familiar with it uh, than others, uh, and there will be some discussions about it. But this really took off during the pandemic. In fact, there were 10,000 licenses issued by state boards through this process uh, to physicians during pan the pandemic. Um, and so one of the questions I get is, you know, I like practicing telemedicine across state lines. I'm doing it in five or six states. How, what's going to happen after the pandemic? Well, you could get a license in those five or six states through this pathway pretty quickly if that's, you know, that's one way of lawfully being able to practice medicine in those multiple jurisdictions. It's not national licensure, but it is expedited licensure that increases access to care, whether in person or telemedicine. And we've had lots of support from the American Medical Association, American Osteopathic Association, many state medical societies, and just a handful of states left they're, they're the ones in gray that haven't uh, formally introduced legislation. If you have questions, we're happy to talk about it. So, of course, in addition to the pandemic, and we've talked about the opioid epidemic, um, so we've had this twindemic and its consequences, and one has been related to the other in many ways. Because if you were getting medication-assisted treatment or various treatments for your addiction or opioid use disorder, during the pandemic, you were also afraid to get treatment, and that led to withdrawal and other kinds of problems. So not to mention depression, anxiety, acute and chronic illness, and we've had lots of discussions this morning already about the lack of adequate uh, behavioral health and mental health services, uh, psychiatry, and psychology. It's one of the reasons the uh, Association of State and Provincial Psychology Boards is exploring an interstate compact for psychologists, because there's a need for that kind of care. So the FSMB has been part of two National Academy of Medicine action collaboratives. One of them is on countering the U.S. opioid epidemic. Uh, the FSMB's liaison to this uh, action collaborative is Dr. Dan Gifford. Dr. Gifford, raise your hand. Dr. Gifford is a past chair of the FSMB. Uh, he represents the state boards, as do I. I serve on, this, on, the, on the steering committee along with Admiral Levine, who is also part of the steering committee. That's one way in which the FSMB is at the table on behalf of the state boards so that the questions and concerns you have are brought through us to those who are in power who make these kinds of decisions. We also have another National Academy of Medicine Action Collaborative on Physician Wellness, and the FSMB has a liaison to that as well. Dr. Art Henger, Dr. Henger, are you here? If you are, please raise your hand. There he is. Dr. Henger is also a past chair of the FSMB, and uh, we're delighted to have him serve as our liaison on behalf of the state boards to that action collaborative. At the same time, uh, one thing that became apparent is there is an opportunity for regulators in medicine, nursing, pharmacy, and dentistry um, to work together and collaborate. So one of the things the FSMB did is partner with our colleagues at the uh, American Association of Dental Boards, the AADB, an organization we've not historically uh, had too many areas of collaboration with, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy and the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, and their leadership are here. We thank them for being here. We created this opioid regulatory collaborative to specifically talk about the issues important to state and territorial regulators related to the opioid crisis, related to overdoses, related to a lot of the things that uh, you heard Regina LaBelle just talk about in terms of harm reduction, in terms of uh, medication-assisted treatments, and other ways in which we can address this problem. Uh, we had our first meeting uh, just last month, early March, in Washington, D.C., at the National Academy of Medicine's Keck Center in Washington, D.C. We also created a website called curbopioidmisuse.org, uh, please go to the website. You will find resources. You will find information about what our organizations are doing to help uh, state boards address this issue. And uh, we'll be putting more information up on that um, over time. So these are some pictures from that meeting of the Opioid Regulatory Collaborative. Um, on the picture on the left, we have the taller gentleman is Dr. Uh, Chris Jones, who is the author, one of the authors of the CDC guidance, proposed guidance for opioids. He's the one who's now part of the FSMB's work group on that subject, or will be. Uh, in, the, in the center, you have me in the blue tie in the center, and you have Dr. Turkanda with the yellow mask. The gentleman in the white mask is Dr. Rahul Gupta. 
Dr. Gupta is the current director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, uh, the same position that Regina LaBelle held previously. And Dr. Gupta is the first physician to serve in that role. And when I met Dr. Gupta, uh, I was, you know, I did my usual spiel, explain how state boards function, explain who the FSMB is, and Dr. Gupta said, Hank, it's okay, I know who you are, because when I was in West Virginia, I was on the West Virginia Board of Medicine, I consider myself an FSMB fellow, I know the FSMB. Nice, so we, the FSMB has a fellow uh, who's working at the White House. Um, so we didn't even know that, but it's good to have someone at that role who understands how medical regulation works. And then the photo on the right there is the CEOs of the um, um, organizations, the NCSBN, NABP, AADP, as well as Aisha Salman from the National Academy of Medicine and Lisa Robin, our Chief Advocacy Officer. Thank you to Al Carter, who's here, uh, CEO of the NABP, uh, along with his chair, as well as David Benton, the CEO of the NCSBN, and his chair, who are also here. Uh, these are important collaborations to work together to figure this out. So we did decide on three priorities at this Opioid Regulatory Collaborative. We actually came up with 10 priorities, but then we had a subsequent meeting, and we said, look, we can't do all 10. We're gonna have to narrow it down to two or three, and we came up with these three. We're gonna try to possibly harmonize continuing education about substance use disorder and opioid use disorder. Now, I say harmonize, harmonize recommendations. Ultimately, we know it's a state's issue. You will decide what's important, but if we can get them aligned and harmonized, because many of you require CE or CME for opioid use disorder, we wanted to make sure, see if we could provide some harmonization. Number two, a lot of what we talked about this, this morning is helping reduce the stigma attached to addiction and substance use disorder, not only of the general population, but also about licensees. And then third, supporting access to evidence-based treatments for substance use disorder and opioid use disorder. Now, at all these meetings, I thought I would share this slide with you. It's not just about us doing the right thing. I take every opportunity, and my board and my staff do the same. We take every opportunity to make sure people know all the good work you're doing. So at the Opioid Regulatory Collaborative, this was one of the slides. We wanted to make sure that they knew that many of our state boards are doing some novel things. We have one of the states has an opioid toolkit. Another has prescribing resources. Uh, the North Carolina Medical Board has Safe Opioid Prescribing Initiative. Uh, we have FSMB's guidelines on that subject. And of course, we have state requirements for pain management. I wanted to make sure that the attendees knew that this is an area we are working at and it's a priority. Switching gears to education, we are an ACCME accredited CME provider since 2016. That happened because of a request from one of the boards. The Texas Medical Board uh, had a resolution at the House of Delegates and said, we want the FSMB to serve in this role because we think state boards can also provide education to licensees in a way that's cost effective. Many state boards were working through private companies or state medical societies where it was not always easy to offer that kind of uh, continuing education. Since that time, that passed unanimously by the House of Delegates, since that time, 35,000 physicians and other non-physician learners have participated in FSMB accredited CME activities, um, 136 activities altogether, totaling 337 hours. Our partners include groups like the Idaho Board of Medicine, North Carolina Medical Board, Washington Medical Commission, DEA, uh, FDA, Federation of State Physician Health Programs, and the National Board of Medical Examiners. Communications, uh, look at that last bullet. Do you know how many, I mean, look at that. Since between April 2021 and April 2022, that's the last 12 months, state medical boards were mentioned 31,000 times by the media. That's a lot. Um, I, have a, I don't know the number pre-pandemic because I don't think we tracked it as much, but I don't think it was that high. So state boards have been in the news for a lot of things. And um, you know, we've, we've given lots of interviews, you've given lots of interviews. Sometimes, just so you know how we operate, if we get a phone call about, can you tell us about what this state is doing or that state is doing, we'd like your comment. The first thing we do is have you ask, have you spoken to that state yet? Um, and then we say, all right, let's schedule something, but then we contact you to make sure we know what you've said, we know that they have contacted you, and to make sure we're aligned. Because we don't want to get into, well, the FSMB says this and you say this, there's conflict. 
Sometimes the media likes conflict. We don't. So we want to make sure we're aligned, and we try to work together with you. If you get called and you're not sure how to respond, we have experts in communication. Our Vice President of Communications, Joe Nickram. Joe, raise your hand. Is Joe here? He was here before. There he is, behind the, behind the curtain there, uh, making sure everything is going smoothly. Uh, Joe uh, has a background in communications. And uh, if you have questions about how do you deal with the media, how do you deal with press conferences, and uh, we're happy to help in any way that we can. So speaking of communications, one of the first uh, statements that the FSMB's board of directors made was back in October 6, 2020, when Dr. Walker McGill was chair. Uh, this was a recommendation from our Ethics and Professionalism Committee. It was about physicians wearing masks. Now, you might wonder, why is the FSMB issuing a statement about physicians wearing masks? Because we saw what several state boards were doing. Several state boards by that time, this is October of 2020, uh, you know who you are. Several state boards had uh, disciplined doctors who refused to wear a mask and were telling patients they don't have to wear a mask, including patients who were vulnerable and could otherwise get sick. And so since several state boards issued that kind of a uh, action, we thought it would be helpful to issue a reminder to doctors that you have to follow, you should follow uh, federal, state, or local guidance as it relates to things like masks. Um, and of course, we know it's a dynamic situation, but especially early on, where we didn't have a lot of information, this was seen as one way. There was a considerable consensus. Uh, even the CDC director, Dr. Redfield, felt that masks were important. In fact, he issued a statement just a week after the FSMB statement about the importance of at least the healthcare workers wearing masks. And then we got a lot of attention back in July of 2021 uh, under our current uh, board of directors, uh, led by Dr. Simons as chair. Uh, this got a lot of attention. Some of you may have seen uh, this CNN uh, broadcast on Anderson Cooper. Uh, but notice it was not, here's the FSMB statement. It was couched within, look at the bottom. There was a doctor who was claiming that the vaccine was going to kill everyone who got it. Um, so I, as is my policy, and I'm sure yours as well, we don't talk about individual cases or individual doctors, but the juxtaposition was a little awkward to say the least. But our statement was meant as, again, another reminder because we saw states doing this, a reminder to physicians that if you're going to engage in misinformation or disinformation, there's a risk that you will be uh, acted upon through disciplinary action which could include the suspension or revocation of their medical license. Now, the majority of state boards understood what this meant. Um, many state boards, about 15 of them, on their own issued similar statements and thanked the FSMB. Others weren't sure. They, they felt that maybe we were threatening doctors. That was not the intent. The intent was to raise awareness of this issue um, and hopefully it gave physicians a pause or a chance to think twice before they make comments that uh, really don't have any basis. And we're, we were particularly concerned about disinformation, even more than misinformation, um, you know, especially if you're going to claim that the, you know, the vaccine has things like chips in them that clearly they do not. Uh, and then the most recent statement we issued was just back in February, again, uh, defending the role of state boards, opposing legislation intended to limit a board's ability to conduct this important work, um, at the same time encouraging legislators to work with state boards. So this is our FSMB board meeting from October. Uh, it was our first meeting where we started to meet. Notice we're still wearing masks at this point, and some met uh, electronically or through Zoom. So it was a hybrid meeting. But this was really our first time after a whole year where we started to uh, you know, begin to meet in person again. And now we're meeting in person in board meetings. But um, we've been meeting regularly through webinars, as I know many of your boards are as well. I want to recognize our chair, Dr. Simons, who has been very active this past year in shepherding sort of decisions for the uh, organization on behalf of the state boards. It's been a wonderful partnership as, as CEO and chair in working on so many different areas with a board that's been very thoughtful, very informed, very informative, who's also done a lot of outreach to the state boards to make sure that anything they do, uh, ha that they have a sense of what your thinking is on those kinds of subjects. So now let me shift over gears and in the minutes I have remaining, talk about assessment services and then information services. So assessment services, happy to introduce, if you don't know already, you, you may have saw, seen him this morning from the new attendee workshop, David Johnson, our chief assessment officer. 
For over a century, the medical regulatory community's role in assessment has been critical to ensure that physicians are qualified and the patient safety is protected. Today, the USMLE program continues to serve the state medical board community through a strong partnership between FSMB and NBME. And with all the many volunteers from the state medical board community who helped to shape the exam in terms of its content, its policies and standards. We've made a number of changes to USMLE over the past year, important changes that we believe improve the exam and will help ensure that it remains well positioned going into the future so that we can continue to meet the needs of the medical regulatory community. Thank you, David. And I'll mention for completeness, we have a, also a very good working relationship with the National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners and their examination, the Comlex uh, USA. There will be updates for both the USMLE and the Comlex during the course of this meeting. Um, so please look at your programs for that. Oh. Okay. Um, so examples of just sort of the history of assessment. Uh, at one time, and I think many of you know this, every state in the union had its own licensing exam for medicine. Um, they were sometimes written, sometimes oral, um, sometimes they involved various laboratory exercises, uh, like doing a gram stain, uh, but this is what the states did on their own. Over time, through the efforts of the National Board of Medical Examiners, the FSMB, ECFMG, ECFMG's leadership is here as well, including their CEO, uh, Bill Pinsky, National Board CEO, uh, Peter Katsifrakis, uh, in 1991, the NBME, the FSMB, and the ECFMG came together to create the USMLE, a historic milestone in the creation of this examination, a unified approach to licensure portability. Um, shortly thereafter, the NBOME uh, organization also created the Comlex USA examination. Uh, the FSMB at one point had its own examination. It was called the FLEX examination. Some of you may be familiar with it. This also got wrapped up into the USMLE exam. Just showing you an example of something we don't always talk about, the FSMB's role in nudging the state boards towards common approaches that make sense, but only if you all agree. We also have a lot of state medical board members contributing to the USMLE. The exam is, after all, your exam. It's, we want to make sure that it meets your needs. We've talked today about some of the changes in curriculum occurring in medical schools and residency programs. We're making sure that the exam also keeps up to date with the necessary changes that need to occur. Uh, but we value your participation. If you want to write questions for the examination, let us know. Talk to Dave Johnson. We'd be happy to include you. You want to serve on various committees that help govern the examination. We welcome the uh, role of the state boards because it is your exam. Some of the changes since 2020, we had several disruptions, as you can imagine. We couldn't administer the examination. Uh, we discontinued the step two CS exam. That was the uh, examination where examinees in person met with their counterparts, not counterparts, the standardized patients. We felt that was not going to be safe, and so we temporarily suspended it, but ultimately we made a decision, uh, the NBME and the FSMB, to permanently discontinue the Step 2 Clinical Skills Exam, uh, which was an important partnership with the ECFMG, and I'll talk in a second about how the ECFMG then pivoted to enable international graduates to still demonstrate their competency uh, and eligibility, ultimately, for licensure. Many of you know we shifted the Step 1 exam from uh, numerical grading to pass fail. Uh, a number of reasons why we did that. We had many discussions about it, but we felt this was the right thing to do um, for a variety of reasons, which we can get into another time. We also adopted a four attempt limit, in part because our data showed that if your licensee has to take the exam more than four times, it is highly unlikely that they will pass. And at that point, you really want to license someone like that. Um, so that's, if you have questions, again, talk to Dave Johnson. This is your exam, and we'll work with you, but wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Um, I apologize, due to formatting, this didn't come out as well as I had intended, but this is the steps that the ECFMG, the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates, took and, uh, for, for the current match, is they created multiple pathways by which, in the absence of a Step 2 Clinical Skills exam, 
How could an international graduate demonstrate that they are able to move forward and get ECFMG certification and ultimately be eligible to take the USMLE exam and ultimately be eligible for graduate medical education in the United States? So we were delighted to attend the NBME's annual meeting just last month. Uh, Dr. Talia, Al Talia, the chair of the NBME, is there um, on the opposite side of Dr. Katsofrakis with the mustache there. But we also, if you notice, not only have Dr. Simons and myself and Dr. Turkonda, but we also have some past FSMB chairs there. Uh, you have Dr. Greg Snyder, who's in the audience. You have Dr. Pat King, who's in the audience. Uh, and you have Dr. John Thomas, who's not in the audience, but was also a past chair. Uh, we value the role of the FSMB and NBME working closely together on assessments and not only the, Nash, the USMLE, but also the specs examination. The specs examination, as a reminder, is an exam that you can require of licensees for those who are already initially licensed, but you have questions about their competency. Finally, information services. Uh, I'd like to now introduce uh, Mr. Todd Phillips, our, our uh, oh, sorry, information services. That's Michael Dugan, our chief operating officer. And then I'll do... We are continuing to make major investments in technology to strengthen and secure our systems and to improve operational efficiency, providing new solutions for licensing and credentialing through digital transformation has been our focus for several years. We are working to reduce redundancies and costs while providing both our customers and member boards with enhanced tools and services. If you look back over the last 10 years, the FSMB has dramatically improved its data and technology capabilities, and there's some really promising innovations on the horizon that will positively transform licensing and credentialing. Thank you, Mike. So one of the things we did was we recognized the value of data. So we, in, a, in response to a grant from the federal government, we created something called Provider Bridge to enable those licensees who are in, interested in helping out in a national emergency to have a centralized location where their credentials could be kept. We worked with our partners at NCCPA as well as NCSBN, National Council of State Boards of Nursing, and the American Board of Medical Specialties. Uh, again, for those who want to volunteer to be helpful, because we know it's not just about licensure, it's also about making sure that health systems know who they are and others so that they can help in, an, in the case of an emergency. This was helpful during this emergency. Uh, there is some legislation to support provider bridge is what we're calling this uh, uh, repository for future emergencies. This was one way in which the Federation was working with our partners to support and help during the pandemic. Uh, some of the backgrounds and goals, again, I don't, I'm, gonna, I'm out of time, but I want to uh, mentioned there were multiple goals to do what we can to use this new technology platform to establish communication pathways at the very least. Some of the digital, digital initiatives, we have a uh, physician data center which houses information about uh, PAs and physicians. We have DocInfo, which is sort of the public facing version of this. You can look up any doctor, any PA in the country uh, for free by going to docinfo.org You'll get some basic information about where they're licensed and whether or not they have any disciplinary action. But to get the details, they need to go to your website to get that kind of information. Obviously, USMLE is a big part of what we do. We're starting to work with our Interstate Medical Licensure Compact Commission uh, to help them with verification of their uh, credentials. And of course, the Federation's Credentials Verification Service created at your request back in 1996 to be a trusted resource for that. Finally, operations, Todd Phillips, our chief financial officer is in the back, I see him. Um, this is Todd. One of the FSMB's six strategic priorities is organizational strength and excellence. And that focus is top of mind each and every day as our staff in Texas and DC go about their work. The last two years have been incredibly challenging for organizations everywhere, but our staff has done a terrific job of adapting to the new hybrid environment that has emerged and we are looking at ways to become even more efficient and adaptable. Thank you, Todd. So just a couple more slides left. Uh, fiscal strength, uh, up to now we were doing well, but now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I think everyone's a little anxious about what that's gonna do to the economy. Uh, but we are focusing on identifying value of our services and products and eliminating waste where we can. Uh, continuing to work at all organizational levels to become more efficient, that's important, as I'm sure it is for all of you as well. Uh, greater reserves do provide us to be able to do more, but we want to be thoughtful about how we use reserves. 
our facilities, since nobody was working for at least a year at the office, uh, we took the opportunity to make some necessary renovations. Uh, some of them were cosmetic, but many of them were functional to make sure that uh, we are there to serve the needs of a state boards. If you've never been to our offices in Euless, Texas, and there's a lot of folks who are new, please, if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, don't be a stranger. This is your home as much as it is ours. Same thing in D.C. Uh, we have a new office now that we're leasing on uh, 1775 I Street Northwest in D.C. Um, that is your space as well. So if you need a place to uh, work in an office type setting, please let us know that you're coming. Make sure we're there. Um, and then we'll, happy, we'll be happy to let you use that space and set up meetings for you, if you like, with various federal agencies or Congress folks. That's it. Believe it or not, you, you went, and I really appreciate this. You know how many slides you went through with me? 70. So thank you. <laughs>